our guest on the show spoke about her son and how um, his journey through addiction affected her life. And also her husband was also uh, an addict. And we spoke about learnt behaviour and how learnt behaviour can possibly play a role um, in addiction. Uh, we went, then went on to talk about um, yeah, her son's recovery further and how he's made it 13 years and how he still even struggles today. So as always, I hope you enjoy the show and thanks for watching. Yeah, my guest today will remain anonymous as always, um, but how are you? Well, I'm amazingly good. Uh, we are talking about two lots of alcoholism. My, in my husband, uh, I mean, that started off as him being a heavy drinker, which was part of the era at that time, and he was a Scot, uh, as I am also, um, but it wasn't apparent to me, and I suppose even if it had been apparent, it wouldn't have made any difference. But over the years, um, the whole relationship deteriorated and uh, the marriage failed. I wasn't cognizant of AA or any sort of assistance and I could feel quite um, guilty about not ha having been any help to him but there's nothing I can do about that now. Uh, as they say, it, it, uh, the, the marriage failed and we went our different ways but by that time I had a nine-year-old son and although I thought it, he was quite resilient and able to cope. Years after, he told me that, no, he didn't really cope, he just had put on an act. And then eventually, uh, whether it was a, a genetic thing, uh, or partly genetic, and partly perhaps, I don't know, it could be learned behaviour, you'd have thought, if it was learned behaviour, he would have learned not to do it and go the same way, but he did. Um, and his marriage went the same, that, that was smashed to smithereens. He took most of the blame, but... Um, well, this is your son's marriage. Yeah, yeah, he took most of the blame, but uh, really his wife, she... She was she was quite a steady drinker, put it that way. Not he didn't apportion any blame to her at all. And it wasn't until he said, Mom, I can't stop drinking, help me. And of course I'm not an ex I wasn't an expert in these things. Um but I did know of um an organisation which didn't deal exclusively with um, alcohol uh, addiction or, or narcotics. It was a right across the board organisation, very small, very modest, but they happened to have a house in Dundee. And I, I, um, I, I talked to my son about it. And I, I said, do you want to do you want us to try and uh, see if there is anything for you? And he said to me at the time, yeah, tell them that I will help with the, um, uh, the people in state of financial devastation, which this organisation um, sorted. Dest destitution really and people into addiction I'll help them however when I explained to the um, organisation or the, 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 the guy 
who happened to be a, a, a religious uh, cleric, priest, uh, he said, well, Mrs. Jones, he said, before you, he, your son helps us, I think we will be able to assist him. And within days, Joey was dispatched up to Dundee from where we lived down south. And um, apparently on the way, nearly never got there. Nearly never got there. Uh, he was going to my sister's and sister-in-law, just outside Glasgow, who was going to put him on the bus for Dundee, but she forgot he was coming. So she, he immediately went into the town where she lived and got absolutely stocious drunk. Eventually he managed to get to, to her house at that time she'd remembered he was supposed to be coming. So she put him on the bus for Dundee the next day. And when he got as far as Perth, he, got, he took fright. And he said, I think I'll just get off. I'll get a job in a hotel, which wouldn't have been the best thing. Anyway, he managed to uh, withstand the thought of doing that, carried on up to Dundee. I didn't hear from him for uh, a good couple of days and to be honest I was really terror stricken really to even find out how he'd gotten on but we did get the call from the place. It happened to be um, a house that was divided into 11 flats, uh, quite ideal the accommodation and then the, the, uh, the, the afflicted ones would be ferried to AA meetings, doctors, uh, and it was the turnabout that I would never have dreamt about. And the call that I got from the organiser said, well, he's here. Um, the only proviso they had was he had to be 24 hours dry. Well, I don't think he was quite dry, um, but they said when next you see your son, he will be transformed. And I thought, you're just trying to be nice and give me a bit of uh, a bump up. But it was very true. But my son was there for seven months um, and yeah, he did get right into AA. He would certainly say now that, it, well he does, he was a lifesaver. And the, the, his contemporaries that he met up with, they were all um, contributing. I mean, it's like-minded people. Um, and then after the seven months, he, uh, he said, I have to leave here, Mum, or I'll become inst institutionalised. Uh, don't know what to do. Again, I knew about um, a seat of education, happened to be in Oxford, and it was, it had been organised again by a religious group well, years back uh, for people on the margin because I mean by that time when you, you're into the throes of alcoholism you are right on the steps of marginalisation everything has gone and uh, yeah he went there he said I'll, I'll stay a month mum he said but he never he never um, had much confidence or self-esteem and of course attributed that to him taking up the drinking big time to bolster him up but um, when he got to the college he said now I can't understand a word that the lecturer is saying but within two weeks he phoned me back and said that the the um, tutor and lecturer 
had perceived that he had um, uh, quite um, an innate notion of things politics, political, philosophical, uh, and the field of economics and forecast that he was he was potentially on the way to something better. Yeah, I think this is the thing we find a lot of time with Alex is that they are extremely intelligent and they do have great potential. Exactly. But like you said before, that self confidence bit where they almost don't believe it. So they turn to the drug in order to bolster them up to get that self confidence. Absolutely that. Absolutely that. He did say he worked for the five the uh, the ten years that he'd worked, but it was fueled by the alcohol because his self belief, well there was nothing there. He really pictured himself to be a dummy, not achieving. I did think at the time he appeared to me to be very lucid and bright. Um, turned out that way. I know I'm not supposed to be really talking too much about him, I suppose. It's my recovery. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm just doing my best here. Um, but, yes, yeah, so he did, he went on to achieve A levels um, and he got a place, he got two or three um, offers of uni, university which he had never ever dreamt of doing, never in a million years. So, um, have to say that yes, it, it, it set him back on the road to recovery. He's still into frequent meetings. I, I'm into the Al-Anon um, group, which again is unique. How do you find um, it's been for you to be the mother of an alcoholic and the wife to one, and also to go to Alamon as well? How did that all well, help? Quite devastating, quite devastating, really. Uh, I, uh, I, was, I was psychologically broken for quite a few years, had a couple of breakdowns. Amazingly, have managed to bounce back, uh, and at the uh, at my vintage now, I'm still quite amazed and uh, ever grateful to uh, the doctors, Doctor Bill and the uh, the other and Lois, who thought up the concept of recovery via Alcoholics Anonymous. And then, then CAA thing, the groups uh, where you meet like-minded people, um, and it, yeah, I I could never have imagined that Joe would have recovered at all. I thought he was destined to die. Um, it was. Quite a few devastating years. Uh, in between time, that that I mean, I had the normal family stuff, you know, parents, not at all well, um, needing a lot of look, looking after, as well as um, keeping um, quite a demanding job down. But yes, still ever thankful to have come across the people that we did, inspiring, and the recovery, I mean it's, my son would still say he is still recovering, still would like a drink uh, quite often, manages um, reasonably well. How long has it been? How long has it been? Sort of well, shopping? we will say it's it's been 12, 13 years since he was in that devastating state. Uh, the seven months he was in Dundee, 
then he was uh, just about able to shake off the drink. Well, he's never had a drink since then. Um, still psychologically quite fragile, has to keep bolstering up uh, any any assisting agency. Um, is swearing by um, mindfulness and meditation. Um, presently, I'm trying to get into the meditation, but I'm finding it very difficult. Um, but uh, I'm going to keep going with it. Um, yeah, as I'm sure you know, I'm a big fan of meditation. Uh, um, yes, I'd be interested, yeah, well interested to know how actually to do it. I, um, I've tried, but I, I do find it hard to um, really do it that successfully yeah. for any length of time. Yeah, well just a quick rundown if you like. Tell um, me, please. Is, um, I see it as you're sitting on the side of the motorway and you're watching cars go past right. and these cars represent your thoughts and you have around 60,000 thoughts a day so you have quite a lot of thoughts and it's not about you know standing in front of the cars and stopping them and trying to stop your thoughts it's about just sitting on the edge of the road and observing them go by and just watching and being an observer of your thoughts and I think the ability to, to do this um, especially helps with addiction because when you have that um, trigger or thought that says I need a drink or I need uh, X, Y, Z, you know, I need to use, I need to use, I'm, uh, I'm shit, I'm shit, all of these le negative low level thoughts that we, that we do have. Um, you can just sit on the edge of that motorway and just watch the cars go past, if you like, and these thoughts, you start to understand they are like the cars that you're just watching go by. And rather than sort of becoming your thoughts um, and thinking oh, I'm an addict or I'm a piece of shit, you understand that you have thoughts. So, you, so I, I start to see that, you know, I have a thought that is, I am worthless, that I don't own it, I am not that, it's a car that will go past, um, and it's just happening in that moment, and you can observe it and just let it go. Um, so that's generally how I, how I view it. Yeah, I, 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 I'm determined to keep, keep at it, because I'm sure it would do me a world of good, sure of it. Um, the like-minded uh, fellowship in Al-Anon, I have really found that phenomenally helpful. Because an awful lot of people... Oh, and the other thing I think I mentioned to you, um, I, I was offered an eight-session cognitive... Um, uh, behavioural therapy absolutely I, I thought at the time I was a bit whimsical about it and I thought well what will talk do just talking about it but that really was well beneficial well so you cognitive behavioural therapy is a type of, of therapy yeah. and you attended um a course in the modality of cognitive pain absolutely therapy. yeah and you found that to be really helpful yeah. as well as having on as well at the same time oh yes i did i did and i would cheerfully um have another have another session um uh, it it bolstered my confidence i uh, i suppose i suppose there is a genetic thing of the the lack of confidence and self-belief which holds has possibly held me back um, uh, not a lot I suppose because I've managed to recover much via the Al-Anon concept um, and if you could say sort of one takeaway that you got from Al-Anon what would it be if you just had to choose one it would it would be to say that people that go to Al-Anon have experienced in different ways, diverse ways, different concepts of 
of the addiction and how it affects you. Um, people who haven't really been into it, the, their perception of the addiction is very limited. But when you're with these like-minded people, they've been there, they've done that, and they know how it feels. So, yeah, absolutely invaluable. And I didn't go for years until my son said, Mum, you need Alanol. And the classic thing was, well, why do I need it? I'm not the one who uh, had the problem, but I did realise I had a, a big problem. And going through the steps, um, etc., it made me look at myself, my behaviour, my reaction, which was absolutely explosive when my husband was in the throes of it. As I say, I was no help to him at all. Um, I also didn't think about myself until I was in Avalon to say to myself, what would I like to do? I mean, I was quite... I smiled when the, the therapist said to me, at the end of it, well, what do you think you got out of this? And I, I was quite happy to say a lot. My self-esteem uh, has, ha, has increased and it has helped me. Um, I said to her, what, what would your, what's your diagnosis of how I am? And she said, existential anxiety. Which of course I think, if you've been a mother, a wife, and you've, you've just gone through the normal things, you're going to have some of that anyway. But I never really, oh, the other thing was, and again, she, I smiled. She said, well, she said, have you got any aspirations that you'd like to do? I mean, probably up to that point, I didn't think I should have. Why should I have, at this stage in my life, any other aspirations? But, yeah, I did smile. And she said, what about uh, relationships? And I, yeah, I, I mean, I wasn't... Uh, I, you know, I was just too wrapped up in everything that I'd been used to all over those years and there wasn't any time for having that, as far as I was concerned. But now, now, I do try to push some of the anxiety away. I can't do it all the time, but I do say, now, what would I like to do? Uh, Obviously, it's nice if you have a partner to do this and that with, but I've learned that I can have the strength to achieve stuff that I never, ever really took on board all those years ago.